Hello, everyone. This is Steve Zerker. I'm your host of the Think Tech program, Looking to the East. This is a show I do twice a month where we look at various political, economic, social issues, focusing primarily on Japan and greater Asia. Today's show, we're going to be looking at the repercussions from the assassination that occurred in Japan, the shocking assassination of the former prime minister of Japan. His name is uh, Shinzo Abe. That was back in February. I have with us a very special guest, the president of Shingetsu News in Japan, Michael Penn. And Michael was actually the journalist who broke the story after the assassination occurred as to which religious organization was affiliated with the assassin. <clears throat> the story came out after the Abe assassination that the motivation for the assassination had to do with the religion. And in Japan, as the media is uh, wont to do, uh, they didn't actually disclose which church it was. But Michael did that, broke the story. And then after that, uh, the other mainstream media and international press as well began to acknowledge that it was the Unification Church that was involved. So we're going to talk about that over the course of the show. Michael, so, thank you so much for rejoining me uh, on the show. I really appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> you uh, acknowledge expert uh, in this area. I think for our viewers, uh, maybe <clears throat> they probably remember when Abe was assassinated because it was an international news story. I mean, whenever my mother contacts me about news in Japan, <clears throat> I know it's getting international coverage. That's my sign that something from Japan <laughs> that she's uh, reading about it. <clears throat> her reaction was uh, one of shock and uh, kind of sympathy, too, because in her mind, uh, Abe was a, a, a positive a government official for Japan. But anyway, can you describe what happened back in February a bit, just for our viewers who may not remember that? Uh, well, first of all, we're talking about July, not February. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. You're, yeah, you're my mistake. a little bit earlier in the year. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, my uh, mistake. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, well, uh, I think most people know this part of the story, which is that uh, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was giving a speech at the side of a road, and uh, a man uh, in his early 40s who had put together a homemade shotgun uh, came up behind him and uh, shot him twice. Uh, and uh, uh, as a result of the, the, those wounds, uh, uh, Abe died, uh, and it was, of course, uh, as you know, it's a, a very shocking event because, uh, well, first of all, you know, gun crimes of that sort just don't happen in Japan, uh, and also because, uh, you know, a political assassination of that scale uh, hasn't happened in the country in about half a century. So uh, it was uh, it was a big event. It was a shocking event. Uh, and it, it had a real political impact. As you recall, at that time, what was the expectations in terms of how the country would respond to this assassination? Um, you know, it was a huge story. I think the initial uh, response was shock. But then, I mean, I remember that this, this could cause greater uh, strength of the Jiminto party, a sense of sympathy. For Abe, um, some of my friends have said this could be a JFK moment. Those of you that are old enough, I certainly <clears throat> remember when uh, Kennedy was assassinated in the United States and what, what the repercussions of that were, which were immense. But was that what I'm describing? Is was that an accurate depiction of, of what the expectations were from your perspective, since you're much, much closer to it than I am? Uh, certainly, I think that both within the country and outside of Japan, people who are observers of Japan, Let's say for the first week or week and a half, uh, the uh, sort of the 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 common sense or the uh, the general view was that uh, this was going to uh, strengthen the political right uh, in, in the country uh, yeah. because people would be worried about uh, you know uh, violence and he was a major figure uh, and the assassination of such a figure uh, as you mentioned you know engenders sympathy even from those who might not otherwise have been terribly uh, attracted to, to his point of view. Uh, so from those points of view, you know, everybody was more or less expecting that this was something that was going to strengthen the right. And it has to be said that there was a full court press, both within the conservative elements of the uh, of the Japanese government, 
as well as in Washington, D.C., uh, to really promote this idea that, okay, well, Abe has been killed, but now we have a chance to really implement the Abe agenda. And there was really the strong, strong push uh, that, uh, that uh, you know, Abe might be gone, but the Abe politics and the things that Abe wanted to do for Japan or do to Japan uh, were now going to happen. And so uh, that, uh, that was the initial expectation, which obviously we're going to talk about next. Uh, didn't quite work out that way yeah, for so various this this is just the amazing thing and why politics is so interesting. The repercussions from this assassination have been are completely different from what we we described. For example, you mentioned the Abe agenda. Abe was always focusing on changing the constitution of Japan to make it uh, Make it a, the military able to be offensive because when the Constitution was written by the Amer by the Americans back after World War II, that was explicitly banned. <clears throat> you know, the Japanese military supposedly is for defensive purposes only. So I remember that, Michael. That oh, now this is going to happen. So tell us what what really happened. You know, in the well, subsequent months since uh, since July. The w the first thing that really kind of threw that off track was the assassin himself. You know, most people, I think, kind of assumed or feared or believed that most likely this assassin was probably somebody on the left, somebody who hated Jap uh, Abe's politics. And so uh, as it became clear that that somehow this, this assassination was somewhere out of left field, uh, it kind of threw the narrative off track. You know, mm. um, and uh, it it was not uh, somebody who was a leftist. It was not somebody who could be easily dismissed as just some sort of insane, crazy person. Uh, it was somebody who had a motive, a motive that nobody expected and nobody even really knew about. Uh, and someone who's, as the story of the assassin became, you know, more better and better reported, uh, you know, the reaction from the Japanese public was wait a second we kind of we kind of understand where this guy was coming from and mm -hmm. uh there was a lot more sympathy for the assassin and his background and what he had gone through and why he uh you know came to the conclusion that he did that that he needed to assassinate uh the former prime minister and uh, of course this is where the unification church uh story came in uh which was on nobody's radar i mean uh, even those people who uh, have, you know, essentially dedicated their career to studying Shinzo Abe and, and, and his policies, you know, this was not something that had been explored uh, and was even realized. So, uh, so basically, it, it was the assassin and his life story, which threw everything off track from what one might have expected to have happened. And then mm -hmm. the fact that the Japanese public, uh, the more and more they learned about the assassin, the more and more they they sympathized with him and liked him, actually. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, that's that was not the reaction that you normally expect in a, in a situation where uh, a, a private assassin kills uh, the leader, uh, the longest serving leader of a country. Right. That's, that's not what yeah. the way you expect things to go. Yeah, I, I that's. That was remarkable. So I, I think you're absolutely right that the narrative was set by the conservative elements, how we're going to take this assassination and, you know, like Rahm Emanuel says, you never waste a crisis, right? So this was a crisis and they had their strategy. And then it turned out, I don't think anybody thinks that the murder is, is forgivable. It, it, he's, he's, a, he's a murderer. He's a criminal and he'll end up in jail for the rest of his life. But I do believe, I agree with you, Michael, that his story resonated. And it, specifically, he explained that his mother was captive, cap, captured by the Unification Church and gave $800,000, basically the family's life savings, to the church, making their family go bankrupt, taking away the chances for this uh, young man to go to college, and he apparently is a fairly bright guy and could have gotten into a pretty decent school. So yeah, I guess the the Japanese media, I'm thinking, you know, the Yumuti and other conservative elements, I guess they couldn't really 
contextualize that into the story that they started with. Is that that's it, isn't it? That's the the problem. Well, that's it. Uh, but then once with, you know, once this sort of initial, you know, the initial wave, obviously thinking there's going to be sort of a right wing crackdown, the Abe agenda was going to be in place. Then the second stage was, hey, wait a second, this assassin is not what we expected. Uh, you know, uh, the public actually has sympathy for him. And then there was the third stage which came up, which is that the assassin and his research and his motives for, uh, for, for, for killing Abe were not based on some fantasy as was first sort of intimated by the media, but actually he was on to something real, which even the, the deepest, many of the deepest experts about Shin Abe didn't know about. And then once the media started to get on that story and like, wait a second, there is actually a connection between Shin Abe and the Unification Church and it's real. And it goes back to his grandfather and his father. And this is basically what we've seen play out in the months since is that uh, the Japanese media and other parts of the media, especially the Japanese media, has really gotten on the story to explore uh, how uh, Tetsuya Yamagami, the assassin, was, was right in his research, was correct in his research about Abe's connection with the church and mm -hmm. how it actually was uh, much deeper and bigger than was understood. And that, in fact, almost half of all ruling party lawmakers had some at least tenuous connection with the Unification Church. So step by step, uh, this is what has sort of developed. And of course, uh, the Japanese public, which first went for from shock over, they went from shock over Abe's assassination and sympathy for, for let's say, Aki Abe, his, the first former first lady, to sympathy to the assassin. And in, the, in that third stage, the public starts getting outraged to learn that some sort of what many Japanese would think is kind of like a crazy South Korean cult has enormous or at least a degree of political influence in the ruling party and uh, links that, that were totally unknown. And so then, you know, uh, what Yamagami himself had wanted, which was to throw attention on the church and to and to basically get his revenge against the church actually happened because the entire basically the majority of the, of the Japanese public came to share Yamagami's view that these people are a problem and that they need to be basically expelled from uh, influence in, in the Japanese political system, which they have had. So mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's really been a remarkable process. And, and of course, the overall effect is that from where we started, that this would be something which would help conservatives and help the right wing in Japan it's actually turned into the very opposite, which is that uh, it's it's put the, the Japanese right wing on the back feet. They're in big trouble. The whole Abe faction within the Liberal Democratic Party has been, you know, defending itself and in trouble. Mm -hmm. And their influence has been cut down uh, rather than boosted. Yeah, I was mentioning uh, to Michael before we started the show, um, I, I don't watch TV other than baseball. I I do watch baseball, <clears throat> Hanshin Tigers in particular. But at my gym in the sauna, they have a TV. So I'm usually there in the afternoon when they have these uh, news, quasi news programs, I guess you'd call them, Michael. And at least two or three times, there's this solemn looking Jiminto uh, ruling party diet representative slowly describing in detail his connections to the Unification Church. You know, on July 17th, uh, 2020, I went to uh, their party or I did a video. It's, it's confessional. And all of these guys are being forced to do this. It's just remarkable. I was telling Michael, I have a Catholic, I'm a lapsed Catholic, so it reminds me of going into the confessional box and talking to the priest and ex explaining about the sins over, that you've done over the last month or so. I, I just am amazed that these guys are being forced to do this. And uh, this has now been going on for months and months and months and doesn't seem to be going away. Well, uh, to, to pick up on that last point, uh, why it's not going away so easily. Uh, this is where uh, the, the ruling party um, messed up its response. Uh, and part of this goes to uh, Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, 
uh, because, but you know, the things actually, Kishida's own instincts were correct. He himself, by the way, had no connection whatsoever with the Unification Church. Oh, uh, really? Okay. Um, but, uh, and, you know, he's from the more moderate faction. He's not the Abe faction. He's, he's, he's basically on the opposite of the Abe faction in many ways. Um, but the, um, but his instinct was, okay, let's just be completely transparent about this. Let's have an, let's have an investigation within the party, you know, and uh, everybody who had some connection with uh, the Unification Church just publish that, get it out there, you know, and, and go through it and it'll be done. But uh, he has not gotten cooperation from the party on this. Uh, in particular, the secretary general of the party, who's the number two person in the party, his name is Toshimitsu Motegi. Uh, who who the prime minister depends on very much to stay in power, um, had the opposite opinion. He's like, no, 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 let's just put out a couple dozen names. You know, we'll do our own survey. We're not going to actually investigate anybody. We'll just send a survey to all of the, the lawmakers and let them self-report. This I mean, is standard operating procedure, right, for exactly. any kind of a crisis at the, the LDP or, or political parties in general. That's, that's right. plan A. Well, this is, yeah, in, in particular, I think the Liberal Democratic Party, they're very, you know, it's sort of like the honor system in a sense with people whose honor can sometimes be a little shaky. But the, um, so basically there was, you know, there was within the party, there was this uh, sense of let's cover things up a little bit. And the thing is, is that one of the, I mean, some of the people who were the most, say, guilty of the Unification Church ties included people like the policy chief uh, of the uh, of the ruling party, his name's Koichi Hagiuda. Uh, he was a, he basically came to power as an aide to Shinzo Abe, and basically it is that sh that Abe faction, the hard right wing of the ruling party, which had the strongest connections with the Unification Church, mm -hmm. which they're completely unable to defend because how do they defend uh, basically a Korean church coming to Japan, getting all this money from ordinary citizens bankrupting Japanese families and using that to fund their, their organization. I mean, it, from the point of view of, of Japanese conservatives who tend to be very anti-Korean and even racist, how do, they, how do they justify that? They can't even justify it to their own supporters. And so uh, it's, uh, uh, so, and, and from the point of view of ruling party, you know, uh, many of them don't want to be completely honest about what happened, especially the Abe wing. Uh, so uh, the prime minister, whose position depends on support from within the ruling party, obviously, mm -hmm. um, is not in a position to demand, you know, and uh, completely that they obey and that they submit to a, a, a serious investigation. So this is where they've had the problem. The political impact has mostly been on Kishida himself who's not the most guilty person. He's just simply not able to control the ruling party uh, as effectively as he might like. Yeah, to, to that point, Michael, his popularity has uh, been going down uh, since this assassination occurred. And this morning it was reported that there are more Japanese people now who disapprove of him than approve of him. 46% disapprove, 45% approve. Yeah, there are two uh, causes for that I should mention. But both related to Shinzo Abe. One is the Unification Church link, and the other is uh, the the his decision to hold a state funeral for Shinzo Abe, which uh, right. by a nearly two to one margin, uh, the Japanese public came to uh, oppose. Yeah. So why don't you? That occurred just last week, right? Yeah. And you're recovering that. Can you briefly describe um, why that occurred and uh, the? The tremendous pushback. I, I read that there were protests mm -hmm. on the day of the state funeral and stuff, which for Japan, I'm, usually Japanese people are, are, are somewhat compliant when it comes to this kind of stuff. They, they do go out and protest, like, for example, the Iraq invasion. Uh, there were protests almost every day for that. But usually these types of outward shows of displeasure with the government especially on a day of a funeral was, was shocking. So can you cover that briefly? We, we're, unfortunately, we only have about seven or eight more minutes in the show. Uh, well, th again, that was also something which uh, certainly took me by surprise as well, that people would, that, that the protest movement would really take issue with the state funeral issue and, you know, pr and protest, as you say, marching in the streets, hundreds of people against a funeral <laughs> uh, for a leader who had assassinated 
the longest serving prime minister, it, it, you know, in many ways is kind of bizarre. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but it turned out to be uh, a big issue. Uh, a couple of reasons. Now, why did it? Why was the state funeral held? Well, that's obvious. Uh, so the prime minister thought he could curry favor with the Abe wing of the party by doing the state uh, funeral. You know, it was it was it was smart politics. Uh, it seemed like smart politics at the time. Internal internal uh, politics. Exactly. But that's who he really depended on to to stay in power, right? To mm -hmm. kind of keep them happy with a symbolic measure, whereas it, with instead of a substantial policy measure, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, but uh, the reaction from the public was, well, wait a second. First of all, we've only had one state funeral since uh, under the current constitution since World War II. And that was for uh, uh, Prime Minister Shigeru Yoshida, who was very, very much important in, in putting Japan on its current path. Uh, and so this, this was not the way that, that uh, prime ministers were usually buried. And there was not state funerals. Uh, there was a lot of people. It's like, well, wait a second. You know, Abe is a very divisive figure. He basically represents the hard right, and yet to have a state funeral for somebody like that, who's not a consensus figure, who was not even particularly popular at the time of his death, uh, you know, again, this was sort of like the the government trying to push its own political agenda. With, I mean, again, don't underestimate how big support from Washington and the Pentagon is in all of this. They they wield enormous influence in Tokyo, and Abe was their man. Um, and so there was also that side of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, you know, there was lots of things about, okay, for, we have to pay for the funeral. Uh, yeah, well, the the costs money. were really, I, I saw seven million. Is that correct? Or? Uh, I, I couldn't remember off the top of my head, but basically most of the costs were because if you have all these world leaders coming in as right. the beginning, then Japan goes overboard on security costs and things like this. Uh, oh, so yeah. most of that money went to, to police and, and various kinds of security. Um, and then, you know, then also the, you know, the fact that people are saying, well, wait a second, you know, now are we basically forced to be, um, you know, to mourn for this guy who we, who not everybody wants to mourn for. And with the unification church, you know, story coming out at the same time and Abe's links with that. And everybody was kind of like saying, you know, Abe had all these scandals. He did a lot. And a lot of the negative side of the Abe a legacy was coming. In fact, I've I've been calling it the Abefication of Japanese politics. <laughs> I mean, um, wow. It, uh, it, 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 we have seen in the past few months since you know this whole since his assassination, really, that sort of like a, a veil of fear is lifting from Japanese politics. Where Abe basically was sort of a scary figure, I think, for a lot of people, and now mm -hmm. he's not there, and mm -hmm. now people are not afraid of him anymore. Now people are mm -hmm. coming out and more openly criticizing. And it's it, both within and out and, and outside of the government. So it, it is kind of like, like I said, kind of a de abification process where suddenly, you know, mm -hmm. there's uh, uh, like after a repressive regime has gone, suddenly, you know, things come out. And that's sort of, that's sort of where we've been for the past couple of months. Wow. So you mentioned that Kishida is bearing the brunt of um, the story about the unification church connection to 50% of the ruling party, and also not just the ruling party, but other party as well, although the numbers, as you pointed out, Michael, are much smaller in that regard. And the state funeral has not helped him at all, so there's repercussions there. Then we also have inflation. Uh, my coffee prices just went up a couple days ago, Michael. I came up with Family Mart, 150 to 180 yen. So Japanese consumers now are seeing the prices are being raised, and there's a sense of frustration that the government's really not focusing on that either. Do you think um, that Kishida is going to survive? I mean, he's clearly wounded and Japan has a long history of turning prime ministers over. Abe, of course, was an exception, but there are long stretches of time when there'd be a prime minister once a year. Uh, and uh, Kishida is, I think, celebrating his one year in power uh, just this week. What, what if, you, if I can get you to look into the crystal ball, is he gonna survive? Uh, my strong feeling is that, yes, he'll survive and okay. he will actually return to popularity before too long uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, all of the problems which are hitting him and which has depressed his public opinion rating have nothing to do with him. They're all about Abe and the right wing of the party. He is not Abe. He was he is not a right wing of the party. He's actually from the other wing of the party and which is kind of the irony. All of the things which have been sinking him have nothing to do with him and his own 
particular political agenda, which he calls new capitalism, is to try to raise the living standards of ordinary people and to try to, to reduce inequality uh, between rich and poor. Basically, mm -hmm. all that Kishida has to do to recover is to begin to act like Kishida, to, begin, to, to really assert his own policies and his own agenda, and he'll be back. And he has a really good uh, one other thing, which is majorly in his favor. There's no elections anywhere in sight. Uh, the, there's uh, unified local elections next spring, uh, but uh, you know national elections are years away. Uh, you know this was supposed to be his so-called three golden years because you know, there's just no nothing on the schedule uh, for him. So I think uh, he has plenty of time to get things back in order. The state funeral's done. That issue is now off the plate. He does mm -hmm. still have to deal with the unification church mess, but that mm -hmm. all is going to lose steam and it's probably already losing steam. So if Kishida can just be Kishida and be a little more assertive, then I think uh, then I think he will begin to recover uh, his popularity. Yeah, we, we just have one more minute. Uh, the engineers uh, telling me, but your last thought, Michael, this this man who planned this assassination, what's happening? I, would he even imagine that what he did would cause this response in the country? He, I mean, again, it's no justification for murder, but he accomplished what he wanted to accomplish, apparently. It's I mean, stunning. I think beyond, I would imagine, his wildest dreams. I mean, who? nobody could have predicted this. I don't think even he would have predicted it. He was yeah. probably felt it was kind of like a desperate effort to try to do it. But whether he actually thought it could have happened the way that it happened, I doubt it. Um, I mean, it was uh, th this honestly has to be said to be one of the most successful assassinations in, in modern history, <laughs> uh, because not only did he kill the person that he wanted, he also helped destroy the, his real target. And essentially, politically, things worked out exactly the way that the assassin would have dreamed they worked out. It, it's an amazing story. Yeah. Michael, are you going to write that story? Probably Somebody not. needs to do that. <laughs> this is just so huge. Yeah, so I have lots of things on my plate, but it is, it is a, it's a fascinating story. I think it's going to make a brilliant book for somebody. Okay. All right, Michael. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for your insights, spending time with us and helping to describe what's going on in Japan. And um, the best to you. Uh, for my viewers, we'll be on again with Looking to the East in a couple of weeks or so. We'll address another topic having to do with Japan or more broadly in Asia. I haven't decided what that is at this point, but do tune in at that time. Thank you again, Michael. Thank you, everyone, for watching. That's a wrap for today. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.